There we go. Good. So how's everybody doing this morning? Got a couple of people here in the studio audience. This is actually a perfect size group because sometimes for this discussion, it can get a little crazy. So, uh, so this is a perfect size group. So the, the, so I, I sent out a bunch of stuff last night when I sent out the first link. Um, but then I just sent out two items today. And so having access to all of that stuff is great, but I, my fear is always that sometimes we get inundated and we'll talk about those. But for today, really the only thing that we're going to be using is this form right here, which is the, uh, my numbers, numbers I need to know. So that's there. And if you, I, I sent this out yesterday and if you had a chance to look at it and you took my advice and, try, and tried to fill it out with this morning's coffee, great. If not, this is definitely something you'll want to do. So speaking of the numbers, how many of you know roughly how much is in your checking account right now, right? How many of you know roughly how much is in your savings account right now? Right, there are some important numbers that you guys need to know, and I would suggest these are them. Now, I'm one of those people that if you give me a number today, I will forget it tomorrow because typically it doesn't matter, right? Uh, my grandmother, who uh, had a master's degree in library science when women weren't supposed to go to higher education and women weren't supposed to be smart, she had a master's degree in library science, and she always said, it's not important what you know, it's more important where, if you know where to find it. And so putting systems in place to always know your numbers could be as simple as every time you get a paycheck, you get a report, three hole punch that and put it in a notebook. That way it's there for you. So if you haven't had a chance to fill this out, do that. And then the second thing, which we will be working on today is this right here. And it's called Success Worksheet, 2023 Success Worksheet. So that's where we're going to be spending quite a bit of time today. Put these over here. So um, right now, today, if you guys want to put it together a business plan, there are a lot of different options for them. So let me, let me share a couple. So there is... There is, let me see if I can find it here. Hold on, push the wrong button. We don't want that. Um, I'm not looking here, here we go. Okay, so I'm gonna share screen. So there are lots of options right now. In fact, almost too many. So this, this one is Tom Ferry's plan. And this is a very good plan. It's uh, quite a few pages. It's 22 pages in length. And it asks you a lot of in-depth questions. The cool thing, though, is you can fill out these numbers and it will automatically populate uh, the results of those numbers. So Tom Ferry's plan is, uh, is a great one. I uh, believe I sent it out maybe in yesterday's email. Um, and it can get pretty deep, right? So business plans can get as shallow or as deep as you want. Uh, the other plan that's available is the uh, John O. Scott plan. And that one, you can simply go to uh, johnlscott.com forward slash elevate. And that's what this plan looks like. It's boosting my business, your annual business plan. And what that'll do, that as well, as you fill stuff out, it will save it as you work your way through it. And then when you're done, it will actually send me a copy as well. And the goal there is to encourage us to set up a meeting to go over it together. So there's the John L. Scott plan, and that's available for you. And then wait, but there's more. If you want one more plan, we've got this one, uh, which is the plan that I use that I use most years. My plan for increased success and balance, and it kind of puts together the analogy: if you're going to hike across the Olympics, you wouldn't just hop in the car, go to the trailhead, and start walking. Uh, you would first take stock of what you've got, what you need, where you're going, when you need to be there by. You'd put together a hiking plan. And so that's the analogy that, that I use for putting together your business plan. And so here again, it asks lots of questions about your business. One of the things that we're not going to spend a lot of time on today, but I would encourage you to do is spend time on your why. 
I mean, why are you doing, why are you doing real estate? I mean, you could be doing almost anything. So be clear on who you are and what you want to do and set goals for yourself financially or what you want to do. So there are some people, and I'll use Jane Woodward as an example, her goals have a dollar sign alongside of them. She's very focused on how much she is going to make every year. There are other people that cannot put together goals based on money. Instead, they put together goals based on what they can do with their money. So your goal sheet might look like, I wanna do a family vacation to Disney World next year, or I wanna go on a cruise, or I want to buy an investment house, or I want to, whatever it is, I wanna remodel my house, right? So it just depends on what motivates you because at the end of the day, the plan is just a piece of paper unless there's some passion behind it. And so that's why you always wanna look for what's my drive? Why am I doing this? What, what gets me up and excited about doing real estate? Now it could be, if you back it up a few things, maybe you just really enjoy helping people achieve their dreams. And so that's what drives you, that's cool. But at the end of the day, you're gonna have some money left over. And so have an idea of what you wanna do with, uh, with your, the money and with your business. And it's not always about making a lot of money. I mean, obviously you need to make enough money to meet your goals. You need to make enough money to put food on your table. You need to make money so that your household is financially stable. So I have brokers that they just hit a plateau. Let's say they're making $98,000 a year and they're happy with that. That's great. To me, that's no better of a goal than somebody who wants to make $398,000 a year. It's just a number. Right, it's what's important for you. Now, I'll speak bluntly. If your goal is to make twenty-two thousand dollars a year, you should not be in real estate. That's not what this business is about, because it costs too much to just make twenty thousand, twenty-two thousand dollars a year. I would suggest if you're only making twenty-two thousand dollars a year in your own pocket, you're probably breaking even. So, or losing money. So, have a worthwhile goal. I mean, shoot, you can go almost anywhere and make, you know, forty thousand a year. Well, if that's not enough, then that's the great thing about real estate. And keep in mind that some of the huge benefits about being in real estate is you are self-employed, which gives you a lot of flexibility with what you can write off and what you do with your financial income. So that's a huge benefit to being a real estate broker. Um, uh, another example of something of, uh, of benefits of being a real estate broker is you're your own boss, which is a two-edged sword right? In that if you have your own self-discipline that makes you get up and run your business every day like a business, then you'll be very successful. If you, on the other hand, there are many people that need a boss, okay? Now, in some cases, I'm happy to help with part of that, although I'm never going to micromanage you. I'm not a micromanage type of a personality, but that's why I offer coaching and what have you, because sometimes brokers say, gosh, I'd like to come in and meet with you once a week or once a month, and that helps me stay on track. So there are a lot of benefits to being a real estate broker because you are your own boss. You get to set your own schedule. But on the other hand, some people don't respond well in that environment. And that's just natural. That's human nature. Some people are better off showing up at eight in the morning, punching in, punching out at 11, punching back in at noon after a lunch, punch out at five, and they leave the responsibilities behind. All I would say is, and what I try to do as I interview people, is let's be realistic about that. If indeed you are a punch in, punch out kind of person, okay, let's talk about your hopes and dreams. What do you want to be and where can you employ that? But that doesn't match with real estate. Real estate, you have to be self-driven. You have to have a little grit. You need to have some drive. You need to have a vision. What is it that you want to do? And so today we're going to get into the numbers part of it and putting your business together. But I would highly recommend that as you go through some of these different business plans, look at and examine within yourself what your drive is. What is your why? Because your why will carry you through the good markets and the bad markets. So get focused on your why. So lots of different business plans out there. I've seen business plans that are almost bound in leather in which the broker fails. And I've seen business plans put together on the back of a, of a napkin after a couple of glasses of wine, and that has been successful. And so what's behind the business plan is the passion. The passion is the magic behind the business plan. So got lots of options. You can use one of the three that I just showed you, or there are others out there that you can choose. The point is just do one. Today, as we work through the exercise, you, you might that might be enough of a plan for you. And that's totally cool. There's no judgment here. Again, it's the passion that's more important than the plan. Um, so uh, there we go. So um, 
so and then here's the other thing that I want to point out is we can plan all day long and we can take classes and we can take clock hours and we can talk about it. But at the end of the day, you've got to do it. You've got to go out there and figure out how you're going to reach within yourself and make contacts every day. Again, speaking bluntly, we're not in the house business. We're in the lead generating business. If you can't generate your own leads, you're either going to fail or you're going to find yourself having to go buy leads from some revenues from some lead generating source. So that means you're giving up a bunch of money. You're giving up referral fees or you're paying Zillow a thousand bucks a month or two thousand bucks or I've seen three thousand dollars a month to hopefully get a bunch of leads that you spend your wheels on chasing. So the haves and the have nots, you've heard me talk about it before, the haves know how to go out and generate their own leads, know how to build their own business, and you wind up keeping all of your own money. If you don't know how to generate leads and you're going to rely on other people to give them to you, and it's going to cost you money. So my goal for you guys is always know how to go out and generate your own leads and be clear of the business we're in. We're in the business of lead generation, interacting with people. Now, that doesn't mean you have to be the jerk uh, brother-in-law who's always selling insurance. That's not the deal. The deal is to be able to interact with your sphere of influence and people that you meet in a friendly manner. And oh, by the way, I happen to be in real estate. Now you can be very direct about it if that's your comfort level, or uh, you can be a little bit more subdued about it. We'll get into some of those. So, but at the end of the day, it's about lead generation and you have to be proactive. And so to me, interacting with a person is a face-to-face -face interaction, which is the best. A phone-to-phone -phone or voice-to-voice -voice communication is really good. Uh, a coffee, a lunch, a breakfast are excellent. Um, then you start going down from there. A two-way communication via text, that's still two-way. I like that. Uh, email back and forth, I like that. So anything that's back and forth with a real live human, that's what I consider a good contact. There are brokers that I know of that think running a real estate business is making a couple of posts on social media each week and hoping something calls, somebody calls or somebody walks through the front door. And you can't do that. You have to be proactive. And I would suggest as we get into this, and I know we'll talk about revenue units and numbers and stuff like that, but at the end of the day, judge your success based on how many people did I talk with this week? How many people did I interact with? And if it's zero, then chances are all the other numbers will be zero as well. But if you can say on a regular basis, I interacted with 20 people a week, well, that probably wound up in having at least one or two appointments. And that probably wound up in having at least one or two listings or one or two buyer transactions, right? So if the numbers on the left-hand side which is how many people did I interact with each week is a zero, I promise the rest will be a zero. And it can't be the proactive stuff where you, maybe you send out a thousand mailers. Oh, I've been busy today. I sent out a thousand mailers. Don't, that does, I mean, that can help, you know, so that can be part of a larger push or a larger marketing program, but just sending out a thousand mailers is not going to do anything for you. And I'm making this up, but you know, the return is like 0 0.0003 on mailers to strangers who don't know you. Now, if you do mailers to people who know you, well, then it goes up to maybe 1% or 2% because people are seeing them. Oh yeah, here's something coming in from Lindsay. Oh, I know Lindsay. And they take it more seriously. It spends another second in their hand before they throw it out. So so again, on, on the left-hand side, because I always go left to right, on the left-hand side, how many people did I talk about, the, did I interact with this week? And if the number is zero, the rest will be zero. I would suggest you set a goal for yourself and that number could be 20. And that might be kind of scary, but 20, that's only a couple a day, right? That'd be what, four a day, five a day? If you did five a day, that'd be 25. If you did four a day, that'd be 20 a week. That, that can't be that scary. And guess what? The numbers begin compounding upon themselves. So if you do 20 a month or 20 a week, that becomes 80 a month. That becomes 800, uh, what, 860 a year or something. I dropped a zero or something. But it becomes three digit numbers, right? Of people that you're interacting with on a, on a regular basis. The other, uh, one of the important features of having a business plan is it's something to always stay constant with. So here's what I mean by that is that often brokers will buckle down and talk with 10 or 20 people a day. And then all of a sudden they get busy. Oh, I got a closing. I got to babysit that closing. Or I've got a listing and I got to get pictures taken. I got to get flyers designed. I got to get silent talkers up. I got to get a sign up. I got to do all this stuff. And they forget to make those 10 or 20 contacts a day. 
So having a plan allows you to wake up every day and say, okay, I know I have all these appointments and I know have, I have all these responsibilities, but what is my daily plan? What is my daily routine? And I can promise you if on a regular basis, you do your daily routine of how many people I'm interacting with, the results will be more consistent. And if the best example I can use is Jane Woodward. I can guarantee you, I would put a paycheck on it right now. Where is Jane? She is in her office making calls. She does it every day from about seven until 11. That's all she does. Whether she's got eight in escrow or whether she's got five new listings, doesn't matter. She's always in her office making those calls consistently, which means her income is going to be consistent. Now, I'm not suggesting that everybody would like to get on the phone and just make calls like that. That might not be a fun way to do real estate. The good news is there's lots of other ways to do real estate that's just as fun. Another person I'd use it as an example of somebody different that, than that is Tara. Tara is out there all the time interacting with people in a natural way. She's interacting with her people and she's very successful at that. Uh, so you have to find your way of doing it. There's no, there's no right or wrong. So just a couple of examples uh, who, of two people that run very different businesses. Um, so let me ask you guys, before we get all into, the, into this craziness, um, let me ask you guys, and I'm going to take notes here. If you guys had, had, had a broker in front of you and they told you, gosh, you know, I'd like to step my business up a notch or I'm not really happy with the business that, I'm ha that I have right now and they're just sitting with a cup of coffee or maybe you guys are at lunch, what advice would you give them? Okay, so I'm going to ask for your input and I'm going to write it down right here on the tablet. So I want to hear from you what advice you would give somebody in real estate that you'd like to help them get, get their business under control. So let's start here in the studio audience. Cindy, what is some advice you would give somebody? Well, I don't know, just try to give advice of the ask questions. Good. Now. Okay. Um, you know, what it is that they are. You know, what part of their business are they not happy with? And um, I like what you were saying earlier. What, what is your why? I mean, I think that's where we really have to start there. That's going to be our motivation to carry us through any any difficulties and hiccups mm -hmm. is to keep remembering why we're doing our, our business. So what is the why? Okay. I guess that would be my advice to them is spend some time. I think three of them. On the nail for me, really. And like that, and that changes my life almost every year. Yeah, yeah. <laughs> Well, that's why you have to analyze, uh, you know, this, so the stuff we're doing today, you could do on a quarterly basis, you could do on a monthly basis, although that might be a little overkill. You do it on a quarterly basis, you should certainly do it on a yearly basis, because to, I like that point that your why can change. And that's okay. That's human nature, right? Okay. Anything else uh, that you might advise this broker? Um, I, I guess to um, just keep your Information and uh, you know ideas on how to how to be in business, how to run a business. Okay, good. Let's jump into the Zoom land and we'll bounce kind of back and forth a little bit. Um, Lindsay, what would you recommend for somebody to get their business up and going? Kelly's better. Oh, okay. I'll come to you in a second, Kelly. Okay. Um, I would say to find a good mentor or team leader. Okay. That's where I would start. Okay. Uh, anything else? Okay. Studio audience. Talk, talk to other people who have been successful. Okay. Yeah. Find out what they did. Good. We didn't hear that. What was it? Uh, to uh, find others that have been successful and learn what they did. Okay. Okay. Kelly, uh, what would you tell them? 
I would say join as many clubs and activities as you can possibly have time for to create opportunities to get to know people and be around them. Okay. Good. Especially if you're new in town. Okay. Uh, Jamie, thoughts? Yeah, I'd say the first thing is um, make a list of everyone you know and and the the primary people who are the core of the people who know, love, and trust you and are going to do business with you, whether you sell real estate or sell ice cream. Right. Good. Now, most of the people we know, they probably live in a house, right? Which means they bought the house and which means they might need to sell that house and buy another one. So pretty much if you know a real live human being, they should be on your list. Because even if they will never buy or sell a house, they know people who will. Remember, I always say everybody knows at least four people every year that are buying or selling a home. So even now, I'm not saying that person who lives in an apartment and they will always live in an apartment should be on your primary list that you're always talking with, unless maybe that person is well connected. Maybe they're the apartment manager and they know people that are coming and going all the time and they can give you a referral. So there's two reasons why people will be in your sphere is either because you hope they're going to buy or sell real estate from you in the future, or they're willing to refer somebody to you. You typically are not going to put people in your list that you don't like or who don't like you. That probably wouldn't be productive. So good. Okay. Uh, let's see. Uh, Elizabeth, do you have anything to add? No, um, I think I agree with everything that's on there right now. The mentor was a big thing for me. I don't think I would have been able to do it without one. Okay, good. Matt, anything uh, you want to add advice that you would give a broker who came to you and said, gosh, Matt, I want to change my business. I want to make it better. Any advice you might share with them? Um, yeah, I mean, just reach out to people. I'm sure you said that. Mm -hmm. uh, okay. Stay in contact. Go be in public. Um, be seen. You know, talk about real estate. The more you talk about it, you know, the more you know. Um, yeah, and just participate in anything you can, mm -hmm. especially if it's a hobby, you know, like a softball team or a basketball team or, or, you know, play cards with people, you know, whatever it is. I mean, just participate, be active. If you just stay at home, you're not going to get very much. You're not going to get very much business from home. Right, exactly. But Good. Being out in public is, is what usually gets you at least talking to people. And we'll spend a little bit of time on that here in a minute or two. But to me, that's the most natural way to do real estate. It's friends working with friends. It's people, acquaintances working with acquaintances. I mean, you could go door knocking. When I first got into the business, um, there was a guy by the name of Mike. And Mike and I are very different personalities. And Cindy, you know Mike. So Mike, one day I came in and he had a number on his desk and it's uh, the number was, th was 300. I said, Mike, what's that number on your desk? He says, that's how many houses that I have to knock on, how many doors I have to knock on this week. So Mike came from a world of Encyclopedia Britannica sales. And I know there may be some people as I get older that doesn't even know what an Encyclopedia Britannica was or is, but uh, that was Mike's thing. And he would go out, he'd knock on 300 doors a week. That was not my thing, right? I could do it. Yes, I could do it, but it wasn't fun for me. So you need to find what's fun for you. If that flips your trigger and you really like going out and knocking on doors or doing cold phones, good for you. You're not going to have a lot of competition because most brokers aren't going to do it, but it is a way that will work. I can, I can guarantee it that if you went out and knocked on 300 doors a day, you're going to have a lot of real life experiences by knocking on 300 doors a day. You're going to come across some pretty interesting people knocking on 300 doors a day. But I do promise that in making those 300 contacts each, each week on a consistent basis, you will have business. Just like picking up the phone every day and making you know 50 calls a day, that's going to do the same thing for you too. However, most of us would agree it's probably not the most favorite. And we'll talk about some options with that. So good advice, you guys. Uh, um, Focus on what the why is, uh, pick a mentor or a team leader. The caveat that I would give for that is while your mentor or team leader will help and support you and guide you, they're not going to do it for you, right? Your team leader or your mentor is not going to go out and make those contacts. They will give you the tools to make it easier to make those contacts, 
Um, they, and just like John L. Scott does, we give you material that makes it easy for you to reach out and make those contacts. But at the end of the day, your mentor and your team leader is not necessarily going to just do it for you. So that would be the caveat I'd have with that. Um, interact with others that have had success. I think that's, in fact, for a new broker or somebody getting started, the most, the best thing you could do is take somebody that you respect to lunch and just ask them all the questions that would come naturally. How did you get started? Uh, what helped you jump ahead? What was the hardest part of the business? Um, what, you know, what did you need to learn first? If you had to do it differently, how would you have done it? So take somebody to lunch who has success and uh, find out what they're all about and then mirror them, right? Just mirror them. It's working for them. You have respect and like for them. It might work for you as well with, with the understanding that sometimes people do things differently than we do. Um, so join clubs. That's a great way to do it. Be seen. It gets you out there. Here's a little uh, pro tip. If you join a bowling league and it costs you money to rent shoes and to bowl every week and you have to chip money in for whatever and you buy a round of beers for the people and guess what? You happen to sell one of their houses. I would politely suggest talk with your CPA that you should be able to write all that money off, right? So joining the club and all the expenses involved in the club, you should be able to write off as part of your business expenses because you're generating income from those endeavors. So pick a fun club and it, my thinking is you should be able to write that off, check with your CPA. A uh, list of everyone you know, you got to start with that, right? I mean, otherwise, all you're doing is working with strangers. How fun is that? So at least start off by getting a list of all the people that are, uh, that you know, uh, reach out to them and then be seen. So, uh, so good advice. Okay, thoughts or comments so far? Okay, we're on track. Um, okay. So now I'd like to introduce you to two brokers. Let me find my two brokers right there. So let me share the screen. So here's two brokers. So the first broker is Jake. So Jake, I'm a broker who's been in the business for two years, going into my third. The first year I did okay, the second year a little better, but I want to get to the next level. So far I have about 35 people in my sphere and most of them get housing updates. I hold an open house about every other month or so. I've had a few listings and most of my business has come from a couple of referrals from two friends. I picked one up at an open house and I think one or two came in via floor only because the other broker didn't show up. I post on Facebook a couple times a week, but I really don't have a plan to go out and find business. Frank tells me that if I do the same thing next year I did last year, that I'll be very frustrated by the end of the year and will probably go to sell hot dogs in the food court at Costco. So that is an option, right? That's always an option. I used to say, go sell shoes at Mervyn's, but nobody knows about Mervyn's anymore. So old guy joke, right? <laughs> yeah, old guy joke. Okay. Um, or it could be Jocelyn. So Jocelyn, I've been in the business for five years and I usually make 250 to 300K. I have a strong sphere of influence from which I get most of my business. I bump into people all the time and real estate comes up. I also hold a client gathering once a year. I'd like to fit to hit 400K over the next 18 months. So those are two, two very different, but very similar cases in that much of the advice that we're going to talk about today, you can apply to a newer broker who's trying to get started or that same advice could be applied to a broker who's already in the business and they want to take it up a notch. Obviously, the person who's making uh, 250 to 300,000 a year has some systems in place already, whereas the newer broker may not have any systems. They're just kind of hit and missing and scattershot. If you're making 250 to 300 a year, you've got some systems in place. So now it might be just beefing those systems up or delegating some of, the, some of the systems off in such a way that a non-licensed person gets those done. So there's some strategies you can use, but the basics are always going to be the same. The basics in real estate have not changed in the 33 or 34 years that I've been doing in real estate. The basics are still there because it's customer service. It's about reaching out to people and finding out if they have a need. So that's Jake and Jocelyn. Maybe you wanna keep those in mind as you work your way, as we work through today's, um, today's session. So, oh, my notes here. Otherwise, I lose track of where I'm at. So, once again, I want to point out to put on a class. Guess what? I have a checklist. Just like if you're putting on a listing presentation, just like you're putting on a buyer presentation, have a little list so you cover all the stuff you want to cover. You don't need to script out every single word. 
I script out the ideas. And then from there, we, the conversation builds, right? Same thing with listing, converse, or with listing conversations or buyer conversations. Before you meet with somebody, get out the old fashioned yellow pad, write down what it is you wanna cover with those people and then just go through it. And they're not going to be offended, just like I'm guessing you're not offended that I have a list. In fact, you probably appreciate it because that way I'll, I'll cover all the stuff maybe you wanna hear today. Okay, so let's talk about this, this document for a while, for a few minutes. So you, uh, I've used this in all the classes over the years. You guys are very familiar with it, but it's something that you have to see and use. What am I doing here? Share screen. Okay, so this is lead generating activities for 2023. So here again, going back to, this has not changed a whole lot in 30 years other than I will say, the social media part has taken a bigger role. The websites have taken a little bit bigger role, but I can honestly say I've never met any broker who has a very successful business strictly on just internet stuff, right? It's, it's one more layer of the cake. That's why in a minute or two, we'll talk about four pillars. You can't rely on just one. Although some brokers do. If you've got a strong sphere of influence, let's say you grew up in Kitsap County and you know everybody and you happen to belong to a couple of clubs and you are very proactive about working with your sphere of influence, maybe sphere of influence and your club is enough to keep you earning the money that you wanna earn. For many of us, we need multiple pillars, but here could be the pillars. So we're not going to go too deep in these today, but sphere of influence, there should be a plan. Everybody is going to use sphere of influence as one of your pillars. You've got to, because that will, your sphere of influence is the one tool that will help your business be better in five years than it is today. If you develop your sphere of influence, it's sort of like building the garden, right? If you build a little garden, it will give you a little bit of vegetables and fruits. If you build a bigger garden, it will give you more of all of those items on a very consistent basis. And so it just depends on how big you want your garden. I would suggest you want your sphere of influence, which is your garden, to be able to produce a lot of good fruits and vegetables. You want that as large and cultivated as possible. So, and there should be a plan for that. Okay, if somebody's in my sphere, how am I going to communicate with them? So I'll give you an example here in a little while. Circle prospecting, that kind of gets a little, that kind of um, blends into open houses or um, or seller listing launch. But for me, and this is one of the ways that I got started in real estate was when there was a listing, I would communicate with 50 people around every single listing. And I had a communication plan and I would do it over and over again. And that's one of the examples that, I, that I'll show you. And then after I got done with those 50 people, I would put probably, I usually out of those 50, I would put anywhere from eight to 12 people in my sphere for long-term follow-up. The rest I would throw away and I would move on to the next 50. So that means every time I got a listing, that was a 50. Or when I first got started, I didn't have a listing. There's a, a broker by the name of Joan um, that when I first got into real estate, she was she was uh, very senior in real estate and she'd get a listing and she didn't do anything to market it. So I asked her, Joan, can I can I take can I take your listings and market from those? I want to market around each of the houses and I want to hold open houses for each of them. And that was in a time in which homes were on the market for 90 days on the average. So Joan said, hey, I don't care. Because all she did, her mentality, where she was in her business at the time was, I get a listing, I wait until we get an offer and it sells, and then I go find another listing, right? She didn't use it like I'm trying to teach you guys to do it, that when you get a listing, you should use that as a way to get three, two, three, or four other transactions from that listing. So I did that instead for Joan, and I did the circle prospecting, and that's how, it's one of the ways that I got my business started, because again, I would communicate with 50 people. At, when I was done, about eight to 12 of those would actually go into my database for long-term follow-up. The rest I would throw away. I'd move on to the next listing. So expires and withdrawns for sale by owner, also known as, uh, as uh, unrepresented sellers, open houses or seller listing launch, uh, res referral generation plan, uh, geographic farming, social farming, professional farming. And quickly, the difference between those is geographic farming is you're farming to a neighborhood. You're farming to people because of where they live. And maybe you live there too, and that makes it easy because you're working with, with, uh, with uh, neighbors and people that you bump into on a regular basis. So it's, it's, it's marketing yourself to people because of where they live. The next one is social farming, and social farming is the clubs. 
you are interacting and marketing yourself to people that you're surrounded with in the various clubs and organizations you're, you're part of. So, I mean, that could be Stamp Club. It could be, I mean, I'm into amateur radio right now. So it could be my amateur radio club, which is actually a good group because they're all a bunch of old guys. And, you know, the time's going to come where we need to sell their houses, right? So, um, and so, uh, so it could be bowling league. It could be church. It could be uh, Kiwanis Club. It could be any group that you want to belong to. That's social farming. Uh, professional farming would be, let's say, uh, let's say that you wanted, uh, so I hired some, a guy a bunch of years ago that was, had been a, um, a dental hygienist. And so that person's sphere was dentists and other dental hygienists. And so that's where you can say, okay, well, how can I market myself to a group of professionals? So that could be CPAs, it could be attorneys, it could be funeral directors, it could be whatever group of professionals that for whatever reason, you're excited about working with that group. It could be financial planners. I mean, what if you identified every financial planner in the area and now you, you sat down and brainstormed, okay, what information can I, can I provide financial planners that will look, make them look smarter in front of their clients? So, hey, here's the average price of a home. You've got $300,000 to invest. One way is a home and one way is into whatever. They can hand them your card, right? So you want to get into that sphere. So that's the difference between those three ones. Um, floor time, cold calling, uh, and internet marketing, and that comes in a bunch of different flavors. So again, each one of these is its own business plan. It's its own marketing effort. You should have another piece of paper with each of these that says, this is what that plan means to me. And it will mean something different to each of you. Because I can tell you if Ruben did for sale by owners, he would have a plan and it'd probably be different from the way that I do, it, right? So have your own plan. And I would, I would go one step further. Each one of those plans should have an end result for you, which means if I'm gonna do for sale by owners, Here's the list of things that I'm going to do as I interact with those people over a period of time. And out of that, I, I hope to get six transactions a year from those efforts. So everything that you do, you're saying I'm investing time and money. You need to have a result from that. And so, if, so pick four of these, four pillars. Sphere of influence is a given for everybody. So pick three others that you like. And if you don't want to do cold calling, don't do cold calling. But I can tell you, you can't do nothing. Right. You've got to do you've got to do some of these things. Otherwise, you have no business or your business isn't at the level that you want it to be. And eventually you may get to a point where like Jocelyn is she's making good money, but she wants to make more. Great. It's time to go back to this list and figure out, do I need do I need to take the systems that I have and make them better? Or do I need to add another pillar? Because there's no rule that says you can't have five pillars. But four is probably the minimum. That's what will hold up your financial roof four pillars. If you have more than that, for a new for a new broker just starting off, I don't want you to have more than that because you can get too broken up or doing, try, trying to do too many things and none of them are creating results. So four pillars is what you're after. I call these pillars. I also call them sources for leads um, or business sources. So this is a, uh, a document that you can use for that. So any questions on the lead generation sources? Questions, thoughts? Okay, most anything you think of will fall into one of those categories. So, okay. So that's the four pillars. So now let's jump into an example. Accessing data, please stand by. And then... Oh, wait, I know Chris right there. Okay. So I'm going to share my screen. It is. Okay, sharing screen. So here are, here's an example. My four, for yeah, in today's example, my four pillars are my four sources of business, aka four pillars. First one's going to be a sphere. Okay, great. I've got a sphere. I've got 100 people in it. I'm done, right? No, you've got to communicate with these people. So how am I going to touch these people? The biggest danger that you can run into is you come in with the fear of, oh, I don't want to over communicate with them. I don't want to burn them out. I'm here to tell you, if they know you and respect you, as long as you're sending information of value, you will not burn them out. They'll see it and they'll either need it at the moment, in which case they may call you, or they're not going to need it in the moment, in which case they're going to throw it away. 
but you're not nine, 99 times out of, out of a hundred, they're, they're just going to, they're going to look at it, either act on it or toss it away. That's, they're not going to get mad at you. Now, granted, you're going to have that 1% of the people that are going to say, don't call me again, or take me off your list. I get that, but you can't live in fear of the one and not do the 99. You've got to just consistently do it. But here's what you could do with your sphere of influence. Again, these are people that you know. In the sphere are people that are your friends, people that are your family or relatives, people that you've done business with in the past, somebody that you've met in an open house that has said, yeah, you know, we seem to get along great. We're going to need to buy a house in a year or so. That should go in your sphere of influence. If you talk with somebody, and my favorite line was, do you know of anybody thinking about buying or selling a home? Maybe a family member, a neighbor, somebody at work. How about you guys? Do you think you might be thinking about buying or selling any real estate in the next two years? And if they said yes to the two years, great. I would put them in my, into my database and I would consistently follow up with them. So I've got a bit of a relationship with them. And now my job is to deepen that relationship over time and with inf valuable and relevant information. So here's what your sphere could look like or your sphere plan could, could look like. Two calls a year, not hard, checking in. How, how's it going? What's going on in your world? Happy Thanksgiving. Hey, we've got the new year started. Do you have any great plans for New Year's? This is a great opportunity to do the Ford technique that we learned in, in uh, Ninja. Ford is family, talking about family, occupation, recreation, or dreams. Granted, there's no real estate in there, and there doesn't have to be because they know you're in real estate. Hey, Frank Wilson with John L. Scott, just wanted to call and wish you a happy new year. So what have you got on the plate for this year? Are you guys going to be going on any great trips? You know, start down the path. They know I'm in real estate find out what's going on in, their, on in their world. And guess what you're doing the whole time is you're taking notes, right? Especially, and I'm playing with it now, but as we get into the new program that we're gonna be launching uh, next year, first part of next year, Salesforce, as you're talking with them, you're writing notes. And then that way, next time I call them, I can pick right up on those notes and follow up on our conversation. But two calls a year, one coffee or lunch. Come on, there's 365 days a year. Maybe you've got 100 people in your sphere. So what if you took out two a week? That's 104 a year. You take to coffee or take lunch or get breakfast with. But it's just that one-on-one -on -one time that you spend with somebody. And you do not have to talk real estate. Again, you're there to just catch up. Uh, just listed postcards. So I would suggest that for everybody in your sphere, every time you get a new listing, 50 people around the listing get a just listed postcard and everybody in your sphere should get a uh, just listed postcard. Your goal in any of these communications is to remind people, I'm in the business, I'm active, I'm successful, I'm knowledgeable. That's all the subliminal messaging that you're sending to these people. Right now, especially with the market shifting as it is, if somebody hasn't heard from you in a year, they're going to assume that you got out of the business because isn't that the natural thing? If somebody gets a license, they do a couple of transactions and the market turns hard, so they leave. So the, the normal assumption for somebody who hasn't heard from you in a while is, oh, you're still in real estate? Oh, cool, right? You gotta stay in touch with them. Uh, so just listed cards, they should get. So in this case, I'm, I'm suggesting that I would like to get six listings this year. So not a big number, that's one every other month. Six listings, that means everybody in my sphere will get six uh, postcards. One handwritten note, a monthly housing update, which comes via email, neighborhood update, which comes via email. And the reason why the neighborhood update is so great, because it's about their house in their neighborhood. The housing update, that's a little higher level. That's talking about what's going on in the community in, in Kitsap County or Mason County or Jefferson County. <coughs> Excuse me. So, um, then a calendar. So I know a lot of you, myself included, I got to get my calendar out. I send out a calendar every year and I send a cover letter what's going on with the market. Uh, mail or deliver two items of value. So you get to figure what that is. You Buffiniites are really good at this. You know what items of value are. So, and it doesn't have to be expensive. I mean, this isn't, you know, you get a car and you get a car and you get a car. No, it could be a little spatula. It could be just something kind of fun. Just make a conversation piece. So two items of value, house anniversary CMA mail. So if you help them buy a home, every single person, in fact, you should have a list. Here are all the people that bought from me in January. Here's all the people that bought in, in, in February, March, April, May, all the way through the year. And every month at the end of January, or let's say at the end of December, you should go to your list and say, okay, who all bought a home from me in January? And then on January 1st, you get producing uh, house anniversary CMAs for these people. And now it's just a matter of getting them out. Hey, do you know what you were doing three years ago? You, we were buying a house together. How's it going? Here's some information. Ugh. And then you either mail it or email it to them. And then you pick up the phone and call them. 
or better yet, make an appointment, go to lunch and present it to them. I know my financial guy, because I look to other industries, my uh, financial guy is with Edward Jones, Glenn Anderson. Uh, at least once a quarter, he and I go to lunch. And one of the first things he does is after we sit down and we place our order, he brings out his the Edward Jones green folder. He says, hey, I just wanted to get you, give you some information to so update you on some changes within this and that. And here's what's going on. And here's what's going on in the market. And then he sets it aside. And we spend the rest of the lunch just talking family, right? How's his kids doing? How's my kids doing? Uh, so it, it can be a very natural thing. So it doesn't have to be hard. It doesn't have to be salesy. So house anniversary CMA, house house anniversary follow up call. So now it's going to be two conversations. If you just mail it to him, then you follow up with a phone call or you take him to lunch. That would be the follow up birthday card or call. So get in the habit of getting clients, people in your sphere, find out when their birthdays are. The sphere of influence relationship is a long term relationship. So get that information. JLS housing forecast coming out here in two weeks. That's going to be a perfect reason to reach out to every single person in your sphere, every single person in your geographic farm. They should get a copy of the housing forecast. Well, guess what? By the time you, you add it all up, that's 41 touches between you and that client in a year. Now, there's nothing crazy about any of this. This isn't being a pest. This isn't being overly aggressive. This is just being politely in the background, sending out information. That's 41 touches a year. So uh, um, the call should be something, something as simple as, how are you doing? Check in on the family, ask for a referral. Items of value could be seeds, could be coupons, could be pie. We just did this whole pie thing, right? It could be a pie. That could be an item of value. We're probably going to do it next year. So that might be something you want to add to your business plan for this year. So the second pillar of this fictitious person is, or Jake, let's call it Jake, is geographic farm. So here again, here is a plan for a farm. JLS annual housing forecast, door knock, leave a hanger, do that twice a year. Just listed cards mailed each time. Again, I'm getting six listings. So everybody in my geographic farm is getting a just listed card. Monthly housing update, neighborhood update, both by email. Calendar with cover letter. Mail or deliver two items of value. Unsolicited CMA, unsolicited CMA follow-up. That's a total of 38 touches for those people in your farm. Social farming, same thing. Attend meetings and events, that's 12 touches a year offer to sponsor something that could be a coffee or maybe they have a newsletter or they have a website which you can have ads. Just have your information out there. Handwritten note, housing update. Handwritten notes are easy when you're in a social environment. You know, you get home after your, your stamp club meeting and you send out a note, hey, Joe, it was really great. Thanks for showing me that stamp. I've never seen one like that. Have a great day, right? It's easy because you're doing stuff that you're passionate about and having fun about anyway. So, uh, so, so, so calendar with a cover letter, item of value based on whatever the club is. So let's say you belong to the, uh, to the uh, yacht club down here, right? And so you own a boat, you're part of the club and you go to the club meetings. What's an item of value that they might all like? How about one of those little tide chart books? right? You could probably buy 500 of those tide chart books and have your name and information stamped on it. And you can hand those out to all the people in the club. They would find that they'd be appreciative of that, right? And you're not spamming them. I don't know, maybe it'd be fun uh, if you're a part of the Yacht Club thing, maybe you send out a thing, you know, the, fo the four most common knots used in sailing. I don't know. That's where you get to have fun. If you're part of the Bird Watchers Club, that's easy. You know, what's the, what are binoculars and what are the different numbers on binoculars mean? Or what are the different birds and when do they come through seasonally? And oh, by the way, if you're going to, if you're part of that, you should also be part of maybe your closing gift is a bird feeder and then monthly seed drop offs, right? So that you can have fun with this stuff. And then circle prospecting would be my, my Jake's fourth pillar. And that's invite to the open house, door knock, leave a door hanger, call 50, get into, get the info from Access Home Tools. So just a reminder, Access Home Tools has a free program that you can use and you pay pennies to actually get the cell phone numbers and the email addresses. And then once, I mean, you only have to spend those pennies once. Once you get that information, it's now part of your database and you can use it on a regular basis to send out emails and make calls. Um, sign in the front yard is an impression. A boards are an impression. Postcards just listed, just sold because you, you always want to send out both just listed and just sold. Meet at the open house. Those 50 people have gotten 10 impressions from me, right? During that period of time that I had the listing, that group of people got 10 impressions from me. And again, this is similar to what I did when I first got started in real estate. 
out of those 50, I'd add eight to 12 to my database every single time consistently. I'd throw the rest away. I'd move on to my next listing. So as we go into today's exercise, that's what we're using as the four pillars. So questions or comments so far? Crickets? Am I no longer sharing or what's happening here? I have one. Um, I've been saving every closing, you know, final statement in a binder to mail out in January for everybody's tax purposes. So yes. if you're in the habit of doing that or haven't done that, do it and then send them business cards and instructions on how to refer you. Because I think a lot of times you say, oh, I'd love a referral and people don't really understand how to do that. And that's sort of at the beginning of thinking, getting them thinking in terms of referring you before the spring season. Mm -hmm. Good. That's a great, yeah, that's a natural one too. Anybody that bought a house last year, they're going to give them, send them a copy of their head one. Good one. Okay. Any other thoughts or questions? Okay. Now let me get back to my list. Okay. Uh, so we did the four pillars, the four sources. Now let's jump in and talk about know your numbers. So this is the part that gets a little thick, right? Because I'm asking you to do some stuff that you yeah, might have to break a calculator on. We're just going to spend a minute or so and go through what these look like. And for those of you here in the room, you've got one in front of you. For those of you in uh, Zoom land, you've got, uh, this is something that I emailed out to you. So let me go back and share screen again. Okay, so this is where if you do as Kelly did, does, which is whenever you get a closing, whether that be working with a buyer and working with a seller or a referral, whenever you get a check, you do get some paperwork. It's either emailed to you or it's printed out. Take that and three hole punch it. I know this is old fashioned, but no batteries are required. I don't care if the internet crashes or you're out of power, just open up your three ring notebook and everything will be there to begin answering a lot of these questions. Again, as you can see up here, it says time frame. You could do this every month. You could do it every quarter. You could do it every year. You should do it on some frequency. Uh, a year is probably most commonly done, but if you really want to micromanage your band, and sometimes, sometimes micromanagement is called for. Sometimes you have to micromanage yourself for a period of time to get you up and running, get your habits instilled, get your morning routine set up, get your whatever routine you're trying to set up. So sometimes micromanaging is called for. So how many transactions did I close? Well, that's kind of easy. Okay, I closed 12 transactions last year. One, two, you can go through your three ring notebook and see how many I closed. What was the total GCI earned from all closings? And the reason why I like using GCI or, or gross commission income is because it, it decomplicates the whole thing. Yes, I know that you pay John L. Scott to be part of John L. Scott. Thank you very much. And I hope we give you value in return for that money you pay us. I know that you have to put gas in your car. I know that you have to make car payments. I know you pay marketing. I know you pay a photographer. I know you pay to put up and take down signs. I know you pay for flyers. I get all of that. And that will come out in your, in your spreadsheet when you meet with your CPA. But from, a, from being able to compare apples and apples, if you just start out with a GCI, then we're all talking the same language. So two first ones are pretty easy. If you added up all the pages in your binder, that would tell you what your GCI. Now we start breaking it down again. Of those transactions, how many were listings? So it's important to be able to get an idea now of what's happening with your business. Am I relying only on buyers? In which case in the market we just came out of a year ago and over the past three or four years, if all you did was work with buyers, man, hat off to you because that was tough. You were working five times as hard as any other broker just with buyers. My suggestion is it, it's not a bad place, especially if you're newer, to be about 50-50. Because if you're 50-50 for a while, at least you know how to do both. And then it, like the market we're going into now, you're going to say, okay, maybe I should start working more with buyers in the market we're coming into. But sellers are still always good. Again, remember the trade-off is if you work with buyers, you don't pay a lot of money out, but you spend a lot of time on the road. That's the trade-off of buyers. With sellers, 
you don't spend a lot of time on the road and you're far more in control of your own of your own time, but you do spend more money on marketing and stuff. So that's kind of the trade-off. When, we think, when you're working only on buyers, your time is not your own. When they're in town, you've got to be showing houses. When a house comes on the market, you've got to jump right on it and get it to them, right? So your time is not your own. With sellers, you can carry, you can carry 12 listings. There's no way you could adequately work with 12 buyers. You can work with maybe four buyers, right? But you could easily work with six, eight, or 10 sellers if you had systems in place. Okay, what is the total gross sale price on all my listings? So here again, you just take your listings and add up what the gross sale price is. What is my average list price? So that's simply taking the number of listings that you got divided by the, uh, the GCI, and that's gonna tell you what your average listing is, how much each listing generates for you. Because you should know, if I get a listing, I know I'm gonna get a $9,000 check. So it, you know, it, it allows you to be able to start working with numbers. What is my average list price? And how much GI, GCI do I earn from each listing? And then where did each of my listings come from? So that's gonna be something you do on the back of this paper is start analyzing where did my business come from? So especially if you're new, at the end of the year, at the end of the first year, even if you only had six people, I always say the first year is what it's gonna be. It should double every year for three or four years thereafter. <laughs> but at least where did those six come from? And then build systems around that because now you already know it's working. Same amount, same stuff for how many uh, were buyer transactions did I close? What was my GCI earned from my buyer closings? What is the total sale price from all buyer transactions? What is the average price of closed buyer side transaction? How much GCI did I earn from the closed buyer side transactions? And then again, itemizing where did each of my buyers come from? How many referrals did I send in? And how much GCI did I earn from closed referrals? This is a part of your business that many brokers forget about. And it's the easiest money you're going to make in real estate. You should have a referral plan or system in place for your sphere of influence. So if somebody from a sphere of influence, ah, sorry, I just mixed those two up. You should get referrals from your sphere of influence regularly. That's just that. However, the business that I'm talking about is when you send a referral outside of your area. So if let's say one of your clients did send you a referral, but it's their aunt in Michigan, you would place that as an outgoing referral and get a referral fee from the home they're selling in Michigan. And then if they're moving to Miami, you should get a referral on that. That's the business that I'm talking about. But going back to what I, the, the cul-de-sac that I started off on is that anytime a client sends you a referral, you should have a plan in place. Maybe you send them a $25 gift card to say thank you and reward them for the for the act of sending you a sending you a lead, even if it's a bad lead, doesn't matter. You say thank you. And then when a lead actually turns into a, a commission check, then you might send them a $50 gift card and say, hey, really liked working with the Joneses. So that's that referral program. But the referrals here in this section are referrals that you place outside of our area through the leading real estate companies of the world. John o. Scott is a founding member of that. So literally, there is nobody that can be moving from anywhere to anywhere that you shouldn't be able to be involved in and receive a referral fee for. So make that part of your business. And it's the easiest part of the business. And if you just did two or three of those a month, uh, that would pay all your basic expenses, right? I mean, how easy would that be? <clears throat> so then uh, so then a couple more questions. How many people do you have in your UCR database? I can't tell you how many people that I talk to. Oh, yeah, I know hundreds of people. Great. Where are they? Oh, they're in my phone. Well, you cannot send out, uh, you can't send out any kind of an email campaign from your phone, right? They've got to be in the UCR database with John L. Scott, because in that way, they're now in a system and you can say, oh, I want to enroll them in housing updates for Kitsap and I want to do it for Jefferson and I want to do this one for Mason. And oh, these people live down in uh, Pierce County. I'm going to send out the Pierce County one to them. So you can't do that from your phone. So they need to be in your database. Uh, it, to me, that's just a real frustration because it's a basic item. And you know, I'm always going to push for more. So for those of you that are newer, get 50. Good job, get 50. But as soon as you get 50, just know that I'm going to push you to 100. My goal for you is to get 300 people in your active database. Now, I know there's people out there that say, oh, I've got 1,000 people in my database. Okay, good for you. But I know you don't know everyone and they all know you. The goal of the 300 people in your database is to when you pick up the phone and, call and say, hey, this is Frank Olson with John L. Scott, they have some inkling of what you look like and what you do and their relationship with you, right? If you have a thousand people in your database, there's no way that you can consistently stay in touch with those people. So I'd rather have you have fewer in your database that you're closer to rather than the ego of a big, huge database. 
I would also politely suggest that all the people that are in your Facebook, uh, in your Facebook, are not part of your sphere, right? Because most uh, there was a time which it seemed like all people wanted to do was gloat about the fact that they have three thousand people, they have three thousand friends on Facebook. Okay, good for you. There's no way you can have a relationship with all three thousand people. So just because you have a thousand or fifteen hundred or two thousand people as Facebook friends doesn't mean that they necessarily know you or if they bumped into you in their grocery store, they'd know who you are. So now I'm not saying don't have those friends, but I would say begin nurturing those, nurturing those Facebook friends into real live two-way communications and begin to build relationship. So then we get on here to the bottom. Um, is there a handful of your clients that have given you multiple referrals and make a list on the back as well? So that way, uh, you, so let's say you do have your 100 people in your database or 300 ideally, and there is 12 people in there that give you referrals on a regular basis. Maybe you want to set up a special marketing plan for them. Maybe they're the ones that you actually spend uh, more money on. And let's say you invite them to a ball game or you send them free tickets to a Mariners game or you uh, send them gift cards to go out to dinner or you take them out to dinner. Those are the people you're going to be spending more time and energy and money on. Why? Because they send you more leads and referrals. And then, of course, the last item on this on the single page are what four pillars are you going to use and employ? So that takes some research on your part. Again, in that list of, of the 13 different ways to generate leads, which are you comfortable with? The first one should be sphere. And this could also change from year to year. So there may be times where uh, maybe, uh, maybe after a year, you look at it and say, okay, well, these were my pillars, but I've got this one pillar that I've been working on and I'm not getting any business from it. Plus it's no fun in any way. Well, then scrap it, put something else in there. Right. So now I would suggest that some pillars, if you commit to them, you need to commit for a two year period, like geographic farming. Geographic farming isn't something you do for a month or two and expect immediate results. Not going to happen. It's a two year commitment. And if you put together a list of all the ways that you're going to communicate with those people and you do it consistently for two years. I'm almost going to guarantee with money back for what you paid for this program, money back guarantee, which you didn't pay anything, so it'd be zero but money back guarantee that you're going to get some business from those activities. Now, if it turns out that you don't, you're either not doing it like you think you're doing it, or it just isn't for you and you should scrap it and go do something else. So questions, thoughts, comments. Okay, so let's jump in and now we're going to do this sheet, the success worksheet. So now I'm gonna switch cameras. Okay, so hopefully you guys can all see my success worksheet here and we'll walk through how this works. So again, as I'd mentioned, I always do everything from left to right. On the left side is how many people am I talking to? How many, how many interactions are, am I having every single week and every single day? That's what, it, that's, it always starts on the left. So what is my source one? My source one is my sphere. Uh, my second, um, my second was the geo farm. My third was social farm. And my fourth is my circle prospecting. So those of you in Zoom land, can you see what I'm doing okay? okay good. Uh, no downgrade Frank, points for handwriting. Frank, I can't see very well, but there's nothing you can do about it. I'm on my phone, so. Okay. Um, okay, so, so that's what you start off with. It's like, okay, what activities am I going to do and behind this, of course, is behind every one of these should be at least one eight and a half by 11 sheet of paper with your plan. How many interactions am I gonna have with these people on an annual basis? So out of my sphere of influence and say, let's, let's just say right now I've got a hundred people in my sphere. And we know that 7% of the people are going to buy or sell a home each year. And we know each person in your sphere knows four people who are going to buy or sell a home. So out of my sphere, how many do I think I'm going to get each month? Well, if I know 7%, so let's say seven, so about one every other month, right? So for January, 
for the first month of the year, I, I hope to get one for a sphere. And actually, I'm going to bump that up. And the reason why I'm going to bump it up is because in January is the easiest time to call people and wish them Happy New Year. So you should call everybody in your sphere right after the first of the year. Hey, Frank Wilson with John L. Scott, just want to call and wish you Happy New Year. How did your New Year celebrations go? Did you guys go anywhere? Also wanted to check, did you get the calendar they sent out? Great. Gosh, the year's starting off crazy. As you know, real estate's been up and down. Do you know of anybody thinking about buying or selling any, any real estate over the next year? How about you guys? Do you think you're going to need anything for the next year or two? Great. Is there anything I can help you with right now when it comes to real estate? Okay. Have a nice day, right? Or if you know them better, get into the family discussion, right? But I'm going to say out of my sphere, I should be able to get two in January. I think I'll probably get one in February and I should be able to get two more in, um, in March. So how about for my geographic farm? Geographic farm, I should be able to get one. I don't think I'm going to get any this month, and I might not get any that month. Uh, for my social group, I hope I may not get any here because in, in January, everybody's partied out my social group, so I'm not going to do anything. But probably by February, I should get one, and I'm thinking in March, I should get one. And for circle prospecting, well, because there were no listings in December, because sometimes that happens, and because the people that want to list a home, they're not going to do that until the beginning of February, I don't think I'm going to get any here. I think I might get one here, and I might get one here. Okay, so this is for the first, for the first quarter. So if we carry these across, how many RUs, and I use RU or revenue unit, that's a listing that sells or a buyer who closes on a transaction. So that's a revenue unit. It's a listing sold or a sale. So it's a closed transaction. So for January, we would say that we've got three RUs coming up. In February, I think I've got three more. And look here in March, I think I'm gonna have four. So that means I'm gonna have a total of seven. I'm gonna have a total of 10. Now I know some of you are rolling your eyes and saying, oh my God, I could never have 10 RUs in the first quarter. Well, okay, you could though, if you do a system, you could. And what if you don't have 10 RUs this January, but because you put systems now in place that you're gonna follow all year round, maybe next January you have 10, next, uh, the first quarter of 2024, you might have 10, but you gotta start somewhere, right? And then, so then it, it's easy because you get out here just so that I can uh, count this high. If my average sale price is, uh, uh, so if I've got 10 RUs, my average sale price is 400,000, let's say, that's gonna be 4 million. So that means my GCI should be, would that be 30,000? Let's see. Oh, come on, dude. Here we go. Okay. Times two, three, five. That'd be, that'd be 100,000 GCI. Okay, so I know that's blowing you guys away. It is possible, but let's say, now pretend we're at late night TV. Let's say it's not 100, let's say it's 50. And let's break that half again. Let's say it's not 50, it's 25. What if you made 25,000 in GCI your first quarter? That means you're on your way to making 100,000 a year. And that's at, at very, ex, very manageable numbers. I mean, if you've got a sphere of influence and you're calling each of them, why isn't it logical, especially in, in January, to think that two people are going to say, yeah, I'm going to have a need. And even if they say, yeah, I think I want to list my home, but I don't want to do it until March. Who cares? You made the calls and now you got the lead to follow up on. And that means in March, you're going to get those two listings. So it really doesn't matter as long as you're doing the activities. So that's kind of the goal with this little system is, and I don't care whether you do it in 22 pages, or you're doing 58 pages or you're leather bound it, bind it. At the end of the day, it comes down to working from left to right. What systems am I going to use? How many two-way communications am I going to have? How many touches? How many interactions am I going to have? How many actual transactions do I think are going to come out of that? And then as those close, how much am I going to make? So that's how you use this is from left to right. And it's really tough when I do these classes because they always wind up with big numbers. And it just scares brokers away. I mean, here again, coming back to, if you had seven 
uh, everybody in your sphere of influence, if you had, let's say, 300 people in your sphere of influence that you interact with on a regular basis, and each of them gave you four leads, that's 1,200 leads, isn't it? People's brains fall out of their head at this point. Oh, I could never have 1,200 leads. Well, yeah, you could if you asked for them, but let's say it's not 1,200. Let's cut it in half. Let's call it 600. Let's cut that in half again. Let's call it 300. Heck, let's just cut it in thirds. What if you got 100 leads from your 300 database? So now you're not even getting one apiece, but let's just say you got 100 leads. And let's say out of those 100 leads, only 25% actually came through. That's still 25 transactions that go to your bottom line. And as you can see, just on this little silly thing that I did, you're, if you do 25, if you did 25 transactions in a year, you're making good money all by itself. But it's usually not going to happen like that. That's why you need four pillars. You need four different ways, systems in which you start generating leads for yourself. But it's it's funny. I was as I was putting this together, I was flashing back to Success Club because for four or five or six years we did Success Club, and we'd always wind. I'd always find myself in this situation, which I'm talking about systems that can generate leads for you. And then the numbers get too crazy and brokers tip over because they say that'll never happen. Well, I can promise you it will never happen if you don't do anything. But if you do something, something will happen. And if you do something consistently, your results and success will become more and more consistent. So I'm um, not screen sharing. So uh, questions or thoughts about this success worksheet? One of the things that I would say that it helps bring to fruition to you is saying, look, what specifically am I going to do to generate leads? And then if I do those activities, what is my expectation of the outcome from that activities? So if it is for sale by owners and you've got your system lined up on a piece of paper that shows here's what I'm going to do to, to work with for sale by owners. And out of that time and effort and money that I spend, I expect to get four transactions a year that's the fun part because it gets onto a piece of paper like this. And now you can look at yourself later on in the year and say, look, I set a goal for myself for four transactions for, for sale by owners and I got six. Wow, good for me. What if I ramped this up? What if I doubled up my efforts? Maybe I could get up to eight or 10 or 12 leads from that process. Or after six months or a year, you look and you say, well, I'd set a goal for four and I only got two. Well, maybe you scrap the program. Maybe it's not a program that's working for you and that's okay. Not every program works the same for everybody. I mean, look at open houses. I know brokers that do a great job with open houses, and I do, and I know other brokers that don't. You can analyze all day long what the differences are, but if it works for you, do more of it. If it doesn't work for you, get it off your list. The problem that many brokers have is that they keep doing the same thing over and over and over again, thinking it was going, it's going to change. I can tell you when I first got to this office in 2009 we were coming off the big crash. And I can't tell, tell you how many brokers that I worked with in this office one-on-one -on -one that were literally spending thousands of dollars a month on advertising, marketing, and all kinds of other nonsense that it's like, wait a minute, focus first on the tools that Channel Scott gives you because you're already paying for those. Focus on all the free stuff first. Then if, if you've got that dialed in and you've got good income coming from that, and you want more, well then step it up and now start spending money with third-party companies. But don't go right to spending a bunch of money with third-party third companies if you're not doing the basics that John L. Scott gives you, the tools that you've got at your disposal and all the free stuff. I mean, and a perfect example of that is housing updates. Housing updates cost you zero. They look good, they're very professional looking, they're delivering relevant information in a tasteful fashion to your clients, and it costs you nothing to send those out but yet most brokers don't even employ that simple strategy. And I can tell you, if you had 300 people sign up for housing updates, and if all those did was automatically go out every month, and then maybe twice a year, I know I'm pushing it, you picked up the phone and called and said, hey, I, that uh, the housing update just came out. I, I saw it jump quite a bit from last month. Uh, did you receive it? What do you think of it? How's it going? What's going on in life? And then you just begin the conversation. I promise if you just did that, you would get leads but it takes first having it in your UCR database, second, setting them up so that they go out for the automatic email campaign. And then third and the hardest part is picking up the, the thousand pound phone, right? Picking it up and calling them. So uh, let me go back to my checklist, make sure I covered everything. And your numbers, work through the success spreadsheet. Okay, did that. Okay, thoughts or comments? Did you guys get 
what you thought you wanted to get by coming here today. Okay, how about in Zoom land? Yeah, Frank, I, I got quite a bit there. The, the thing is, is information overload. You, you, you got to pick what you want and do that. You're not going to be able to do it all. Well, you can't do it all. Exactly. And you can't do it all consistently. So that's why I always promote pick four things, your four pillars, come up with a system and then do it consistently day in, day out, week in, week out, market in, market out. It shouldn't be something that you stop just because the market shifts. No, it's something that you need to consistently keep doing to get consistent results. So here's, here's my request of you, is that you do some kind of a plan for next year. It can be the Tom Ferry. It can be, uh, it can be the John L. Scott one. It can be my silly hike across the Olympics one. It can be using this uh, success worksheet uh, program. It does not matter what you do. It's important that you do something so that way you at least have a system in place. And as I said earlier, it's not the plan that will make you successful. It's the passion behind it. So delve in and find out what it is that drives you and why you're doing this in the first place. Okay. Well, thank you, everybody, for being here. I am here and available to meet with you one-on-one -on -one for your business plans. I know Jamie, she's making herself available for her team as far as uh, putting together their business plans. Um, once you get a business plan filled out, and don't feel embarrassed if you come in and it's written on a napkin, I don't care. Are you kidding me? If you came to me with a business plan for 2023 written on a napkin and crayon, you would be head of 90% of the other brokers that are out there. So come up with a plan, call me, tap me on the shoulder, let's set up a time to go over your plan. We can flesh it out. And then if you'd like, if you really wanna get daring, we could meet on a monthly basis thereafter to see how you're doing with the plan and then work on changing, making changes to those plans to make sure they fit your needs and they fit what your goals are. So thanks for being here. Have a great week in real estate. Most importantly, have a great 2023 because it's here. Thank you, Frank. Thank you, Frank. You're still the best. <laughs> Thanks, Phil.